Catalina and Craig Smoke. All right, if you uh, have a question you'd like uh, to ask Max Olson, text it to us at 254-339-1122, and we'll try to get that to him. We have plenty of our own Max Olson, the athletic.com national writer, covers college football, 365 Sports Sick and 365 Radio. So what I saw where Sam Kahn wrote a lengthy piece on the Texas Tech broadcasters, we've discussed it. We didn't spend an entire, like, too much time on it. It was, uh, it was. I, I listened to the audio. Max, uh, do you feel like the Big 12 did the right thing? And uh, your thoughts on just the story itself in this year of so much in college football? <laughs> yeah, I appreciate y'all having me on. And uh, my reception's a little spotty, so if you lose me, I apologize. But, uh, you know, it's a strange deal. I was watching that game. You, you saw there was clearly a lot of outrage among Tech fans about a bunch of calls that were reviewed and went Iowa State's way. I don't know if those calls necessarily were all wrong, uh, but but certainly the the Texas Tech uh, you know radio crew was, was fed up and uh, and went pretty crazy about it. And I you know from from folks I've talked to in the Big Twelve, it seems the issue here is not being critical of, of officiating in the radio broadcast or Bob Bowlesby or or even trying to say the Big Twelve wants the other team to win or anything like that. I think the, I think the real issue there was that. Uh, they, they took that extra step of, of reading off the names of everybody on the officiating, officiating crew uh, on, on the broadcast. And, I, look, I know those names are public record. They're on the front page of the box score and all that. But I think that th- there's maybe a, a little bit of a fear that that could incite people a little bit, especially if Texas Tech had lost that game. Um, so, maybe, you know, you don't want to see that happen. It's not like the Big 12 is monitoring all of these, uh, you know, radio calls and, and, and trying to – you know, gotcha anybody on this stuff, but I think they felt like that one crossed the line, and I, I, I get where they're coming from, uh, but certainly one of those things that is, uh, uh, you know, infuriated and, and, and probably brought together that Texas Tech man base. Max, we've been talking about this for the last couple of days with, you know, Justin Fuentes out at Virginia Tech and, you know, who fits into what job. Do you see Tom Herman sneaking his way into this cycle at all? That's a good question. Um, you know, certainly what we're seeing right now, too, is, is that some of these schools that want to get the jump start on it, um, like you, like you've seen um, with uh, you know Clay Helton and, and Jim Moore getting jobs, is that uh, those people that are you know not you know not currently in college roles, maybe it's a little easier to get in contact with them and, and feel them out. I've heard that Tom Herman's pretty happy with with his uh, you know his role in the NFL right now. Certainly, there's a pretty good chance the Bears staff gets fired at the end of this year, based on just sort of all the the. the uh, you know, displeasure people have in Chicago with Matt Nagy. But, um, you know, I've heard he's pretty happy in the role he's got. But, but sure, uh, we are heading towards a really, really crazy coaching carousel. As you all know, I'm sure you talk about it every day. Um, I, 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 I can certainly see, uh, you know, him and his agent wanting to, you know, feel out what's out there, uh, especially if there are a bunch of jobs changing uh, in the state of Texas. So, Max, so one of those guys that's been rumored, obviously, is Dave Aranda because of the success that Baylor's had last weekend. Big opportunity against Oklahoma. Needed to win to stay alive in the, the Big 12 race. And, you know, they don't beat Oklahoma very often. Just the fourth time they've done so. But uh, it was it was pretty impressive. What were your thoughts on uh, the Bears and Sooners and, and now the, the loop that throws the Big 12 for in some ways? Yeah, very, very impressive. Um, you know, wasn't, wasn't shocked by that outcome. You know, and I don't know. I don't think that that necessarily means that, that Oklahoma's fraudulent or anything like that. I just think Baylor had a, had a great plan for them and executed it well. Probably could have won by even more points if he executed on some of the stuff early in the game there and take advantage of some of your opportunities. But um, that was the final score wasn't some massive blowout, but but I thought that was you know a pretty impressive butt kicking. And I mean, I don't know. You guys have seen both of them up, up front now. Who do you think is better, Oklahoma State or Oklahoma? Oklahoma State. Oklahoma I State. think Oklahoma State still gets that edge. I mean, their numbers and you. I think know, so too. Yeah, I do. I, I, I think their defense is just obviously it's not even a comparison with OU, yeah. and I think their offense. Max Spencer Sanders is just kind of managing the game, run game super strong, and I think their receivers they don't have like a name guy like they have in the past, but they've got a bunch of just really good young guys. Yeah, you know, and they they dealt with so many injuries at receiver uh, at the start of the season, like like their six top guys. Mm-hmm. All getting hurt, and missing games, um, and, and that threw Spencer Sanders off a little bit in terms of his his production and accuracy and all that. I think that's gotten a little bit better. Certainly, Jalen Warren um, has allowed them to, you know, have the best rushing offense in, in the Big Twelve in, in league play. Um, but you, you know, you look at some of the stats offensively, 
these guys, I know it's weird to see, but like these guys are playing like Wisconsin. I mean, they really are. They're, they're, they have an elite defense that, that is really sound in, in all phases of defense, um, all metrics. And, and they just play to it by running the ball. They're, they're running the ball more than anybody in the Big 12 right now. And, uh, you know, the pass, they're throwing it okay. Sanders is playing okay. But, man, they, they play great defense and run the ball and, uh, and, and certainly play to their strengths. And it, I think it's a, you know, they, they destroyed TCU. And, and now, mm-hmm. you know, if they can beat Texas Tech this week, they're in, in terrific shape here to, uh, you know, be in contention for, for going to Arlington and, and maybe even the playoffs. I, I th- it would be they had that first game, which is Stillwater, Baylor and Oklahoma State. And Baylor, of course, has had that ugly moment. Uh, when they were destroyed by uh, by TCU and Oklahoma State has not had that. In fact, speaking of which, uh, I think both defenses are really good, but Baylor's had that throw up game. Oklahoma State has not. You wrote about that about where they are statistically, and you took them all the way back to the Adamic and Sioux 2009 Nebraska Big 12 team. Yeah, you know, you look at uh, just look at, at conference play here, and, and, and Oklahoma State, you know, had some struggles in September. weren't very, They weren't very impressive in their non conference. Late, and it wasn't even a very hard knock on place. Not very impressive. But since then, um, you know, in, since Big 12 play began, um, you know, they, they're, they're, that defense is holding Big 12 offenses to 15 points per game. And, uh, you know, from a yards per play standpoint, uh, you know, the, the, the points per game and yards per play, best since we've seen in this conference since 09. Now, you got to sustain it, obviously, and you got to play Oklahoma, and maybe Oklahoma puts a lot of, a lot of points and yards upon you. But, they have held every team they've played this year uh, under 400 yards and under 25 points. And the only other, other defense in the country uh, that can say that is Georgia. So, uh, you know, it, it's been super impressive to watch. They're great against the pass. They're, they're great against the run. Uh, you know, you guys saw it live. I mean, it, it's just really hard to move the ball on them. Yeah, they're 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 – <laughs> They're like a wood chipper. It's the best way to look at it. Paul, you used to use that word when it comes to playing or fighting up against a defense like that. Uh, again, it's Max Olsen, theathletic.com, college football writer with us. Max, what did you think about uh, Virginia Tech and Washington this week? Uh, both opened up, and those are those are pretty decent jobs, pretty good ones, and with a lot of potential. Uh, who do you think are fits for those? And are you, are you surprised, maybe even a little bit, by Washington moving on from Jimmy Lake so soon? Yeah, not, not surprised by those. Those firings, the point they won, seemed like it was heading that way kind of all season. And they've, you know, had moments in the past where they contemplated whether it's time to move on. Um, you know, I, I, I think that I, I think that's a good job. I mean, I, and I think that's probably part of why they're making the change is just the belief they can be a lot better and, and, and you know, be one of the premier programs in the ACC. And, you know, certainly on the East Coast, there's going to be, I would think, a lot of coaches that would make sense for that, whether it's Jamie Chadwell or. Uh, you know, I, I, you go on down the list. There's, there's lots of folks I think that probably would look at that job and say there's real potential there. Washington also not surprising because Jimmy Lake has just had a really bad year, has, has made a lot of a lot of mistakes, and you know was suspended uh, certainly for their last game. You know, I, I think that uh, Chris Peterson has, has raised that thing to a really high level. They thought that that Jimmy Lake could uh, sustain it by by being past the torch there, and it just really didn't work. So. Uh, very curious to see, you know, how big a swing they take on that. But, you know, there's a lot of, you know, sort of top five, top ten type of jobs that could potentially open or are already open. But but those are two really good ones probably in that next tier of schools that I think a lot of coaches are going to go after. Max, 57-56 in overtime down in Austin last weekend. Lance Leipold and the Jayhawks with a signature win. Uh, I mean, I don't. I don't think that it was a total shock, just given the the losing streak Texas was on. But still, it was a shock to see Jayhawks go down in Austin and, and get a W. Your thoughts on what unfolded, the the storybook ending with a guy who hadn't even played offense, and and obviously there's a lot of negative fallout for UT and Steve Sarkeesian right now. What do you make of the result for both clubs? Yeah, you know, it was it was just really insane watching that. Uh, excuse me. Just insane watching that unfold over the course of the game. And, and it's not one of those where, oh, man, Kansas, like, man, it closed the last second. No, Kansas was, like, beating them pretty good for, yeah, yeah. for that whole game. It was not very fluky um, how that went. And, and what's wild is that, you know, Kansas has, has had the worst power five defense in the country, and Texas was even worse in that game. Um, just really has fallen apart on that side of the ball. Not a lot of great talent there, but certainly the confidence is, is plunged. And it's surprising because, uh, you know, their, their D.C. Pete Kwiatkowski has always been very good. Um, so it's hard to know what to make of that. 
certainly you've seen Chris Elkani and other people kind of come out and support a start here after 10 games. Hard for me to believe Texas, you look at that schedule and what they got left, um, I don't I don't think they're going to a bowl game. I, I, they got to win out. you got West Virginia, I think, in K-State. I, I, I just can't see them winning both of those games. So it's going to be a pretty uh, pretty harsh offseason, I think, in, 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 in Austin that makes you reassess the staff a little bit and, and probably kill some of that recruiting momentum that you should have in that first full cycle. Max Olson, the Athletic.com college football writer. Max, do you have a Heisman vote? I do. All right. It, it, all right. Have you? I'm, I have one too, and I'm honored to have one. But is it almost on yeah. every other? And we don't have the vote yet. And I, I'm always until the last second. But is it been one of those pendulums or roller coasters? One week, one guy, or Pickett, or Walker the third, or Bryce Young, and you just can't like grab your hands around somebody yet. I, absolutely. I, I have no. I have no idea who I'm going to fill out in that ballot. <laughs> I, I really don't. And and you know sometimes. You know, like from the media standpoint, I, I know we can be kind of prisoners of the moment, and you kind of wonder is somebody just going to like place well in one of these conferences? That all the posts, it's still feels so wide open. And so, yeah, no, I, I, I certainly feel like you know I need to do my homework to you know. I think we lost Mac. He's Max. He said he was in one of those spots. Okay. Yeah, well, he answered People it. People kind of by default had uh, Kenneth Walker as their number one, and maybe maybe he'll be the guy, but I, I feel like there's still room for, for somebody to rise up here. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate it, Max. Anything else? Max Olson, theathletic.com national college football rider with us on Sikkim 365 Radio. Yeah, I always enjoy this segment with Max because we can cover a lot of ground, and, and if his reception was a little better, I was going to ask him, you know, Michigan, Ohio, or Michigan State, Ohio State, and, and get into a couple more games, but there's some good stuff there, and – yeah, uh, I'll, I'll talk in off the radar a little bit about the Heisman odds and, and where we are with that right now. It kind of depends on where you look. Please like if, do, because I have no you, idea either. I mean, if, depending on where you look, uh, you know, you might see one guy above the other, but for the most part, it's just a cluster. I mean, it's just a cluster of guys with no real leader in the clubhouse whatsoever. But, uh, yeah, I'll run down the candidates and kind of where they sit here in about 30 minutes or so. All right, at 430, Mickey Spagnola, Cowboys in Kansas City. Ought to be one heck of a game. Could end up being one of those 37-35 4340. And then again, who knows? Kansas City got kind of looks like they got a little tuned up with what they did against the Raiders this past weekend, but they have absolutely not been by any means uh, in the mode that they were the last couple of years when they won a Super Bowl and then lost in a Super Bowl uh, as well. Yeah, you brought up a, a interesting point about that West Virginia Texas game. That's a bowl game. That's mm -hmm. a, it's a bowl eligibility game. Whoever wins that is going bowling, and whoever loses that will have to win their their final game. And West Virginia, last I looked, I haven't looked today, but last I looked, they were slight favorites. Um, I think given what we saw last week, I mean, you know, West Virginia hasn't exactly been super impressive by any means, but they've been more impressive than Texas has as of late. And It's in Morgantown. It's in Morgantown, and, you know, they just beat Iowa State there a couple weeks back, and, and they're good enough to beat Texas, there's no doubt. Uh, Texas is good enough to beat them too, but, yeah, that's a really interesting game because somebody is going to go in the final weekend – you know, fingers crossed having to make a bowl game or, or you know, having a long offseason. And for both those programs with Neil Brown, I don't think he's in any, on any hot seat right now, but there's definitely enough, like, chatter of, like, okay, where is this going exactly, you know? And then for Sarkeesian, obviously, I mean, I'm not ready to put him on the hot seat just yet, but, man, that thing is starting to at least get a little bit warm. And I know it's too soon to, to really go too knee-jerk, but – I'm really curious what would happen if they lost well, these last two games, especially if they lost them badly. Because, um, well, man, you go into the offseason with like a seven-game losing streak. Yeah, that Jesus. would be insane. If they lose one of them, they're not going to a bowl. Right. So, yeah. right. so that, that alone, I think what happened with the Kansas game, you know, I saw people like, oh, Sarkeesian's on the hot seat. They'll fire Sarkeesian this year. And Bob, I said, no. I think what happens with Steve Sarkeesian this year is that uh, the Kansas win, whatever goodwill of – you know, when he gets asked questions, well, coach, how do you feel after spring training? I like what we have. I like to see that. Well, the Texas fans are going to be like, yeah, shut up. Like, that's what it's going to be. Nobody's going to hear about his optimism, and they're going to have to prove it on the field, which is what you have to do anyway. But all of his goodwill will be gone, which is unfortunate, but that's the how the kind of works. How often do you have a coach 10 games into his first year? And believe me, even though Baylor only played nine games, I know some of you wanted to know about Dave Aranda because it was not very good. Uh, but but ten games into that his rule. year, yeah. that rule, that rule 11, was a bust. Yeah, uh, and and ten games into his year, and he's having the AD and the president or the board of regents or whatever, and uh, Kevin L. Tyfe and 
And then Del Conte having to put out words of support for him. You know what that did? That, that, that actually that the back in the ground. Those those boosters and donors who are the ones that run that program are hot as hell right now. That's what that actually did. Like when they came out with those statements, uh, yeah, especially the first one from Del Conte, I said. Oh, well, he really is uh, starting to approach the hot seat. That's mm -hmm. what that told me, not the opposite. It didn't tell me that, like, oh, no, we're giving him plenty of time and we're going to let him build and do all that. It told me that, like, clearly there's enough angst and negativity going on that we have to address this, which is not a good sign. Anytime you have to give a vote of confidence like well, that, that is not a good sign. And he's got, like, Jimmy Lake, well, I mean, now he doesn't get a chance to redo it, but he lost to Montana. You, Jimmy, he would have had to win a national title for them to forget about that. Matt Rule lost to Liberty. And, um, and and to UTSA, but to Liberty, the Liberty game, Matt Rule, for the rest of his life, no matter that he almost won the Big 12 for Baylor a couple years later, there are people with Matt Rule's like, yeah, but he lost to Liberty that, that first week. And you're like, well, bu buddy. You know, like they, there were extenuating circumstances. Uh, Dave uh, Aranda might be the one who has the fortune of saying, like, well, I mean, shoot COVID. I mean, like, you can say COVID, which is great for all those coaches last year in the COVID year. I mean, Michigan State struggled last year. I yeah. mean, some of the best teams in the Justin country. Fuente had Old State hey, struggled. Justin Fuente had Old Dominion, right? Yeah. So Old Dominion, that game was was a like a pockmark that he was never going to be able yeah, to wash off or get off. From, get from Steve, by the way, uh, uh, from Frog Fan again. You mentioned earlier about uh, the uh, uh, Tom Herman. He didn't want them at T. He didn't want Herman at TCU. Uh, appreciate the show. Great, thanks for the comments. I wish TCU uh, had a good program. They have been. They've just been kind of slipping. They've just been slipping, and that's why eventually this this change. And then Patterson probably imploded a little bit himself with some of the things that he used to be able to do. That when you're losing, you don't. It's not as funny, and you get a little bit tired of it. But Maybe a breath of fresh air is what you need, but Patterson gave them a hell of a run, no question. Yeah, I mean, whoever the next coach is, Sonny Dykes or whoever it ends up being, they're going to be set up pretty nicely. I mean, you've got some good talent on campus. I don't know what's going to happen with Zach Evans. I mean, he's only going to be around at best another year, and, and maybe not even that. That's fine, but, you know, you probably feel pretty good about Chandler Morris, uh, although you want to bring in some more competition around him because he's not a sure thing by any means. Uh, Quentin Johnson, you probably only got another year with him. So, I mean, I think next year they're set up pretty okay. I mean, obviously there's a lot to address, though, on defense, too. I mean, that, that's been, that, that was the last thing to kind of fall that really started to mark the end of the Gary Patterson arrows when you couldn't even rely on a solid defense anymore. And that's when people are like, whoa, wait a second here. Like, we can deal with, you know, erratic offense, but bad defense in Fort Worth? Like, that's not going to fly. He's clearly lost it. But, yeah, he had a firm handle on that program for a long time. That's a good job. It's a good location. Uh, all that, and I think there are, as much as some guys want that splash big program job, there are the benefits of being a smaller private university uh, in a, a talent-rich state like Texas. So uh, Sonny Dykes or whoever, I think they're going to be set up really well. It's obviously a very important hire for that AD. Um, and you know, Jeremiah Donati, uh, it's going to be you know kind of what he's he's judged on, I think, moving forward is who that is. But, but yeah. I ranked it second yesterday. Huh? I mean, all the things yeah. you said is why I put it second, just in the in the fact of there's a lot of things you don't have to deal with and that you could reap the benefits for, and you don't really have to dig that big of, you know, the dig of a, a cavern to find the treasure. You yeah, know? I'll say this about TCU. I think they're going to look back years from now. You know, it's going to be the same time period that they look back on, but with Baylor fans, they look back on this last, you know, close to a decade now. And it's going to be marked by a scandal, but it's also going to be marked by some terrific head coaching hires and being able to just, it's been a roller coaster, but it's, it's had as many ups as it has had downs and it's had some pretty big ups. And Dave Aranda has got them in line for even more uh, moving forward. But on the TCU side of things, while Baylor was dealing with the brow stuff and the scandal and the fallout and the NCAA thing hanging over their heads. And then here's Jim Groby's an interim and here comes Matt Rule and Matt Rule's gone. And here comes Dave Aranda and Dave Aranda debuts in a COVID year. They're dealing with all that. What did TCU deal with during that same stretch? Nothing. Nothing. Not a single Nothing. freaking thing. No. And they played basically the same level they, of football. They, and they let it get loose. And they it, it all started when Browse was fired. That rivalry was white hot. It was one of the better rivalries in college football. It was heated. Uh, and those two teams hated each other. They feel like they fed off each other. They did. They yeah. fed off each other. And it was like once Art was gone, TCU should have grabbed that ball and just taken off with it. And because instead, they were recruiting the same players too, weren't they? Yes, but yeah. instead they grabbed it. They kind of made one first down run, then you know got stopped for like losses of five and six, made another positive run, got stopped for losses of five and six. They took no advantage of it. And I think that's going to be something you look back on, especially considering during that same time period, Texas was down. 
I mean, Oklahoma was great, but Oklahoma State got great this year. You know, they weren't necessarily this good the last few years. They had so a window of opportunity. They had a window, and they just, like, threw a baseball through it instead of climbing through. And, and I think that's going to be something that they look back on with a little bit of regret. They were, con- they were able to continue to beat Texas yeah. until this year. And they were always dominating Baylor for the most part, except 19. And even those were some uh, – that was an amazing game. But, yeah, you might have let something slip through your hands. Baylor keeps punching back. They do. All right, when we come back, the Cowboys and Chiefs, we mentioned it a minute ago. Um, well, we'll see. Kansas City and the Cowboys. Pat Patrick Mahomes and Dak Prescott. Sikkim 365 Radio, 365 Sports. 